talked about the opportunity to sink, swim, or sail. That when the storms come, we can go down with a ship, we can sink right there, we can be trying to tread water, or actually maybe we could sail. Now, the kind of the basic idea in terms of this deep-rooted faith or this strengthened faith, we have to have a foundation. It can't be all just fervor, all just good times, all just emotion and passion, and this is great, this is awesome, this is wonderful. Certainly, there are times when that is the case. But what about when it's hard? If our relationship with God is based always on a high or always on a, boy, this really feels good, what happens to our faith? Do we enter a crisis of faith when the storm really rages and our lives are really threatened? And so thinking about having a foundation in faith and also the fervor, there is a certain kind of process of design or thinking or of operation in terms of sailboats where you balance uh, the idea of stability versus speed. It's great to be fast, but you have to survive the storm. So the thing about sailboats is you can either be a coastal sailor or what's called a deep water sailor or a blue water sailor. So you can sail along the coast. You can either uh, take your sailboat, put it on a trailer and haul it there with your pickup, put it in a local area, sail around for the day, go home. Or maybe you've got a larger boat and you keep it in a really nice marina and you go out, you know, and the weather's pretty and you say a little here and a little there. And then, of course, you come back and dock it. You could even travel, just kind of go down the coast when the weather's good and go from nice marina to nice marina. But if you ever really want to explore, if you ever really want to sail over the horizon and see what's out there. So you're going to sail from the, the west coast to Hawaii or Australia. You're going to sail from the east coast across the Atlantic. One of my favorite books as a teenager or growing up, I remember reading a book that my dad had called Tinkerbell, where a guy sailed across the Atlantic in a 14-foot sailboat all by himself. Now, you talk about small, that's small. If you're ever going to venture out of the sight of land, the thing about a sailboat is it does not have the speed to hurry back when a storm comes, so you've got to be able to to not only survive, but to sail through a storm, to continue your journey. Not just survive it, obviously that's important, but, but you want to get somewhere. So is there a way to harness or respond to the threat and the power and the enormity of a storm in a way that actually helps you navigate or actually accelerates you? Now, the way a sailboat works, there's a few pictures here. Here's a, we mentioned uh, this one last time. This is a lateen rigged sloop, and then you've got a schooner, and you've got the old-fashioned square-rigged uh, clipper. But what a sail does, it is the airfoil in a sailboat. that it, The wind strikes the sail, and the sail converts the energy from one direction to another, causing lift or bringing about lift across the sail. And then underneath the boat, there's a hull, and it's the, the hydrodynamic lift. And so when the wind hits a sailboat, instead of it just being pushed sideways, the hull allows it, the shape of the hull, the keel underneath, allows it to move forward. And of course, the harder the wind blows, the more pressure it puts on the sail, and the sailboat wants to tip and could even get knocked down. And depending on the design of the boat, some boats tolerate that pretty well. Um, some will sink if you do that to them. So you have the keel underneath that is not only a counterweight to hold and balance the pressure of the wind against the sail, but it converts this sideways pressure to forward acceleration. Now you see in the picture a number of different kinds of sail uh, designs or a sail plan. One of the things that's important when we're thinking about being in a storm or being in a lot of wind, I don't know if you remember the sailboat in the little video that had just the one little sail. It had just a storm jib up front. As the wind continues to increase and the boat continues to heel or lean over, there is a point where the wind can become so powerful that the keel is being overpowered. Or you're putting stress on the cables or you can actually get a mass ripped out. There's a point where there's too much pressure. So what has to happen is the sails are trimmed or changed. You basically reduce the size of the sail. It's called reefing, or if it's in a vertical fashion, it's called furling. 
But the idea is that you shrink this sail, you shrink this sail, you make it smaller so that there's less pressure. Now, you won't lose any speed because the wind is so intense that a smaller amount of sail will deliver the same amount of lift or of pressure that the keel converts to acceleration. So consider this. We've talked about this idea and we've said, well, so the keel is our faith. It's our stability. It's what grounds us. It's what roots us in our trust with God. If the sail is about how you take the pressures of the storm and convert that to energy, maybe we could consider the sails our expectations. Because when everything's great and, and um, the whole world is ours for the taking, we unfurl all of our sails, we take everything in, we're going with everything. But if we are flying too much sail when the storm comes, we're going to experience a knockdown. That's why sailors, when they see a storm coming, the clouds on the horizon, the wind beginning to shift, already start making adjustments to the sail area before the storm gets there. There is then the strength of, and wisdom of adjusting our expectations as the storm comes. Let me give you an example. If you believe that because you're following God, that He has guaranteed you that you will never have problems in life, you're going down. <laughs> if your expectation is that because you know that God loves you, He'll never let anything bad happen to you, you're going to get knocked flat. See, what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says that he causes all things to work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He doesn't say that everything's good, but rather that it can work for the good. The difference between everything being good, that's day sailing. That's out on a pretty blue day. You might even say, that this, these are coastal waters here. Here's the the nice little surf waves, you can run out there and maybe grab you a little boogie board and play around with the kids. And it is some bumps, some ups and downs, kind of fun, no big deal. But if you get out in the blue water, you're going to run into waves that are taller potentially than even the mast of your boat. It's like a frightening cliff of water about to fall on your head. And so what we expect from God, what we think God's going to do, um, can make a significant difference in our ability to sail and to navigate over the horizon into the deepest waters. You'll notice here a different kind of vessel. This is not a canoe. It is a model uh, of the ark that Noah built by God's direction. It's a model fashioned after the uh, replica, the full-size replica found in Kentucky in what's called the Ark Encounter, and it has a different shape. We'll talk about this a little bit later in some of our studies, but the main thing you'll notice is there's no masts, there's no sails, because this is a ship that wasn't designed to travel. Its job was to float. There was no destination but merely the survival of the storm in the same location. So that's why there's quite a bit different design. There's no need for propulsion. They're literally not going anywhere. Now open your Bibles, if you would, to James chapter 1. So we talked a little bit about boats and some sailing, maybe a couple of ideas. But we've mentioned time and time again now that life brings storms. Okay, well, what is a storm? Well, consider... What James says here in James chapter 1, he says in verse 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren. Wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. Consider, consider. What does that mean? To consider something is to think about it. So how we consider something is based on how we think. Could it be that James is starting the conversation by trimming our sails? Now, this is a conversation about expectation. So the way we think about something is going to have a significant impact on how we experience the storm. So when he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So trials would be a definition of life's storms. When hard times come, when difficult things come, and we have to endure it, we have to experience it. We don't get to run into a, a close harbor and 
and, and wait it out in a really nice, comfortable marina. Nope, we're out in the middle of it, and there's no going around it, no getting away from it, so we're going to have to go through it. But he trims our sails. He helps us adjust our expectations when he says that we should consider it all joy when we encounter such things. That tells me that if the storm is coming, that I could either like, oh, this is no big deal, leave all the sails up, get knocked flat. But you know, there is an opposite reaction where I say, oh, no, this is terrible. We're all going to die. The boat's going to sink. There's no hope. And we get all the sails off of the boat. And now we have just the boat. Well, that would work if we're intended to simply float and not travel. We're not trying to go anywhere. But if we're following Jesus, he's on the move. Jesus accepts us just the way we are, true, but he absolutely refuses to leave us that way, that we're on a journey, that discipleship is about traveling with Jesus. So we got to keep going. If we take all the sails down and just take them all down and say, oh, this is terrible, we're all going to die, we better take all these sails off and just not go anywhere, this is not an ark. This is a vessel designed differently. It has a pointed bow, which means to survive these giant waves, it must be bow first, that it must be driving forward in order to survive, that it has a rudder on the back, and in order to steer it, it has to have movement in the water in order for the rudder to be effective. The sails must balance the pressure of the keel. If you've ever been on a sailboat when there's no sails up, the thing rocks around like crazy because you've got this big old mass sticking up there, just a wobbling around, and the whole thing is wobbling, and it's a great way to feel kind of, I'm not sure about this. But when you get pressure on the sails and you start it to lean, it kind of locks in. And now you've got the leverage of the wind pressure versus the keel. A sailboat is designed to have its sails up. So denial, fly all the sails, no big deal. I can handle this. I'm not worried. It's going to get you knocked down. Oh, no, there's no way we can survive. This is a terrible thing. We pull all the sails down. We'll also get you knocked down. The wind will turn the boat around sideways to the waves, and it gets knocked down. So we need to have a faith that lives in the middle, in the middle between a lukewarm status or a nonchalant status versus a fearful status. James says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. There's an adjustment. Now let's look at an example of a storm. And so I invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. And let's crew with some folks of faith as they encounter a vicious storm that threatens to destroy them and everything that they know and everything that they love. And we might ask the question, there are times when we can sail into a fog where we can't see and we can't function. And so we're going to look at fog versus faith. Are we in a state of deepened confusion or are we still trusting and able to navigate even when we can't see to do so? So John chapter 11 begins in the opening verses with two sisters sending desperate and urgent word to Jesus. Their brother, Lazarus, is sick. It's not just any illness. He is about to die. In fact, he will die in just a few verses. So this illness is incredibly severe, and the message is ultimately urgent. They ask Jesus to come, and John goes out of his way several times in this chapter to say that Jesus loves them. So what we're about to see is not going to be negligence, it's not going to be um, unconcern, but rather love. However, it's going to be foggy, it's going to be hard to see those landmarks or those navigational beacons. In fact, Jesus said in verse 4, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. If you've read this chapter before, you know the ultimate end that he's talking about. But if we put ourselves on deck with the disciples, it seems fair to conclude the only thing that they'd be thinking is, oh good, he's not going to die because it doesn't end in death. Jesus is saying death isn't the end, but that's not probably what they're hearing. They're hearing probably that he will not die. 
So Jesus waits for two days. He allows the storm to completely overtake the sisters and the friends and the rest of the family. Then, and only then, does he then begin to navigate toward where they are in Bethany. Jesus says a confusing thing in verse 11 when he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may waken him out of sleep. See, already Jesus is is calling us to sail over the horizon, over the horizon of death itself. He is saying that death is not the end. In fact, Jesus is calling death sleep. What is the permanent, perpetual, unending, irreversible state of death to you and I is to Jesus no more than a mere nap. That it is restful, and it is temporary, and that it is healing or transformative. Generally, we feel better after we sleep, whether we're talking about a good night's rest or whether we're talking about a nap. The body is recharged. That's how Jesus sees the storm. Now, his sails are trimmed differently than probably most of ours. He does clarify in verse 14 that what he is saying is that Lazarus is actually dead. And they haven't made the connection between why he would call death sleep and compare the two. But then in verse 17, he finally arrives at Bethany. As he comes, he finds out that Lazarus, in verse 17, has already been in the tomb for four days. I mean, death is permanent, and four days in the tomb just certainly solidifies that truth. Uh, It strengthens the obvious that he really, really, really is dead. In case you thought maybe... He had passed out or simply was unconscious or maybe they just didn't know the difference between a coma perhaps uh, and death. Four days in the tomb is long enough to be able to know he really, really, really is dead. There's no doubt here or question about that. Now, why did they send word to Jesus? In verse 3, when we read, the sister sent word saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Well, have you ever had a loved one in distress. If you have, then you know that one of the obvious experiences is fear. The whole reason that they send an urgent message is they need Jesus to intervene. They believe that if Jesus, rightly so, that if Jesus doesn't intervene, their brother will die. One sister goes to Jesus, but what is this statement, but Martha stayed at home? boat leans just a little bit and it begins to accelerate. And sailboats are fun. They, they start making noise. They start gurgling and they start kind of humming and vibrating. And you can begin to you can get a sense how the power is being transformed. And, and God is with us and God loves us and everything's going to be fine. But things are not getting fine. They're getting less fine. The intensity of the storm continues as Lazarus gets sicker. And then they realize, hey, this is critical. And now now they're really leaning. The waves are getting high. They're getting wet now. They're getting slapped in the face with cold water, stinging their eyes. And so they send a messenger to Jesus to say, help us. This storm is getting crazy. We need you. Now, Now listen. We need you to still the storm. Take it away. If Lazarus is no longer sick, if you take the storm away, hey, look, everything's better now. We're back on an evening. They had to have a funeral. And Jesus wasn't there for the funeral, wasn't even there for the funeral. They had to have the funeral, and then they had to place the body in the tomb. So now, where are they in this storm? How, how much further can they go before something rips these big old sails and they're real light, um, almost, almost delicate because they're more efficient, they catch more wind. But when they see a storm coming, they'll take down their fair weather sails and put up what's called storm sails. Storm sails are smaller. But they're also much more rugged, much thicker, much heavier duty, so that when they start flapping in the wind, that they're less likely to shred and tear up. Jesus is giving Martha a set of storm sails. He's giving her a, an important truth that she needs in this storm. Because he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is. Jesus is our storm sail. That even if we get completely knocked down, even if her brother dies, the truth is Jesus is our resurrection. 
our victory over man's greatest enemy. Our worst defeat is death, and yet Jesus is thus our greatest victory. If Jesus is our resurrection and life, then there can't be any sinking. There can't be any defeat. And then he says, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now, there may still be uh, confusion as far as, Lord, I don't know how that works, because Lazarus is dead. Well, there's something deeper about, well, but he's not. He's still in the presence of God, and he's an eternal soul, and he's created in the image of God, and he'll be with God forever. That's all coming, it, it, but you can see it being developed. He gives her a truth that will allow her to continue sailing through the storm, not give up and not be overwhelmed, but to keep on sailing. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. That's our stability and our strength. It's not about that we're never afraid. It's not that we always understand everything, but that he is always going to be consistently there for us. Verse 28, when he had said this, he went away and called Mary, her sister, and said secretly, the teacher's here is calling for you. So she heard it. She got up and was coming to him. Jesus still hasn't made it to the village yet. He's where Martha had met him. Verse 31, the Jews all go with Mary. They think that maybe she's going to go to the tomb to weep some more. Verse 32, therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you, have, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, we've heard this before, but there's a significant difference in punctuation. When Martha said it, there was a comma. If you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So there's a comma which extends to, but I'm still hanging in there, I'm still trusting you, even though I'm confused. Mar uh, Mary ends her statement with the period. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Period. Full stop. That's it. There's no but still. Maybe this gives us some insight into why Mary doesn't go meet Jesus in the first place. She seems to be still hurt. I think we see resentment. You weren't here. I, it's easy to conclude at this point, well, you know what? If you don't care about me, I don't care about you. So there's two ways to ride through waves. Here's one way to do it. We talked a little bit about this last time. Here are some images of ships powering through these massive waves. And the ship does it uh, because of its power. And the hull's designed in a way with its bow and transom that, that with that kind of power, they just sort of shove their way through. And you got to make sure that all the hatches are sealed. Everything uh, stays tight. Because in some of these images, you'll see what's called uh, smoke on the water, where this mist, this storm-blown water is like a mist. And it's just covering and inundating the ship, and even to some degree looks like smoke um, coming off the bow like it does here in this particular image. That's actually mist or water, but it, it looks like it's like smoke because it's so finely driven um, by the wind. So this works, but it depends on the ship maintaining power. We saw a video last time of that cruise ship that had lost power, and it had it was in dire, dire straits because it didn't have the design um, to work with the elements. So what you see in this particular design is, call it raw power, that we're just going to get there, just going just gonna to muscle up. Uh, and that's, that's like living life, and you know, I got this, I'm fine, it's all good. But the problem, even with these big ships and these storms, is the the pressure, you can lose power to the engine, you can finally create damage to the hull structure because the pounding force is intense. But all that water moving has great power, and sooner or later you, you break a window, you rip a hatch out, you tear things loose, uh, and then it's a matter of time as the ship begins to fill full of water. A different way is the way you see this particular sailboat. Now the waves are not as big. This is a racing boat out on the open ocean. And you see how many sails he has up. Now, here's a um, cutter rig sloop. It's got three sails going. And these are the real lightweight. Um, they're, they're a Mylar or maybe even a Kevlar kind of material, so it's super fast. As the wind increases, what they'll have to do is keep reducing their sail area 
to keep the balance between the pressure they're experiencing and what they can convert to movement. But this is so much more graceful. You see how we're working with the water rather than fighting it and shoving and pounding into it. This is more about riding it, about going along with it. I like the word harnessing because it's, take, it's taking the storm and using the very storm to propel us in faith, to propel us in life. And so with Martha and Mary, they've entered into a crisis of faith that comes from the, the set of their sails. That they, They've got some trimming, some adjusting to do. It's come as a complete shock and, and great pain that Jesus let them down. He, he didn't show up. If you had been here is the message that res- resonates in this particular context. They haven't got to the point where if he chooses not to come, that's okay. They assumed that because he loved them, he would come and heal Lazarus. Jesus certainly can. But what if that's not his choice? God can still the storm. He can take it away. But what if that's not his choice? What if he allows the storm to continue? What if he brings a typhoon? He could stop it. But what if he chooses not to? Is that okay? Is that the point where we begin to resent God or we break trust with God to say, look, you know what? If you don't care about me, I don't guess I care about you. What are our expectations about God, and will that help us, carry us, propel us, um, accelerate us to our destination over the horizon in the great exploration, or does it knock us down? Does it cause us to reef in, in fear? And so what they need and what we need is a decision of trust. A decision of trust. Is the Lord someone that we can trust? Because if he doesn't show up, or if he doesn't say yes, or if he does something other than what we've requested, is that okay? What helps them in their trust is Jesus speaks truth. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm everything you need, and that's the truth. Everything else we can, we can go to, we can, we can try to depend on, but sooner or later those things fail us and we experience the knockdown. One of the most absolutely amazing things about this text is the example of surrender. Now, Mary, you could read this as her being confrontational, maybe even maybe even disrespectful. I mean, she just simply says, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And isn't it interesting that when Martha talks to Jesus, he has this conversation and says some really deep things. But you'll notice when you read this text, he doesn't say anything to her. He doesn't engage in that conversation. He knows she's not at a place where she can hear. It's not a time for her to have a rational, logical conversation. She's too busy hurting and perhaps even being resentful. So what Jesus does, in verse 33, he sees her weeping along with the Jews, and he also is moved in spirit. And he does ask her one thing, where have you laid him? And they say, the crowd, Lord, come and see, and Jesus weeps. Jesus doesn't try to talk her into something, but rather he joins her. This isn't the first time that Jesus has just quietly gotten in the boat with somebody. It's hard to, you can imagine you're in a storm and you're bobbing around and the sails are shredding and it's scary and water's everywhere. And somebody comes along and their boat's just, I mean, handling, it's great, it's perfect, no problem. They come alongside you and you're doing all this and you're about to die. And the captain is going to start yelling instructions and giving you tips. (laughs) You're not going to be able to hear that. You're too busy trying not to drown. What Jesus does is doesn't offer tips. He gets in the boat with her, joins her in her weeping. And then they go out to the tomb in verse 38, and he says, remove the stone. Don't you think if Jesus could raise someone from the dead that he could move the stone? But he calls them to engage with him in this. I think one of the most interesting jobs in a sailboat in a storm, so there's the captain back here, he's steering, and that's a lot of fun. But the boat's leaning over and it's pitching and it's, it's doing that and swinging and swaying and water's breaking up and over and like you saw in those videos and the, the bow of the boat's disappearing. 
when it's time to adjust the sails, because now the wind's really gotten crazy, somebody gets to get up and move and get up on the front deck and adjust this sail in the middle of all of that. That is a ride. Uh, often they wear lifelines, of course, because all this water's breaking over and pouring over and the wind's howling. You could get swept off and then, you know, then you could see how long you can tread water. What a job to move up to the front. But you can imagine the captain saying, get up there and, and furl the jib. And you're sitting there, I'm not going up there. What, are you crazy? You seen how much water's? I'm not going. I'm sitting right here. In fact, I'm putting my seatbelt on. You do that and you lose the ship. Somebody's got to get up and, and deal with it. In the old days with the square riggers, when the masts were way up there and they got these square sails, those guys had to climb up those catwalks, those, those rope ladders, climb up there and stand up there. And, and if, if the boat's moving around this much and you go up 100 feet on a mast, then how much movement is that? And some guy standing up there riding that thing. You imagine after being a sailor in a storm, you get home, what would you do for excitement, right? Nothing. I mean, everything would bore you, wouldn't it? Somebody's got to go forward, and that's what Jesus does. He says, move the, sto the stone. Go up there and trim the sail. Go up there and, and, and adjust your expectations. Act on a different expectation. See, it's all been about despair. If you had been here, now it's, a now it's time to act on hope. Act on hope. And so they have to move the stone. That's why Martha says, ah, you know, he's been there four days. It isn't going to smell good. This would be a horrible thing to see. Jesus says, didn't I tell you that if you 